everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today to CCK's Veterans Legal Lowdown podcast. My name is Maura Black. I'm an attorney at CCK, and I'm joined today by Christine Clemens, also an attorney of the firm, and Nick Briggs, an accredited VA claims agent. Today, we're going to be discussing new burn pit legislation. First, we're going to start off by going through what are burn pits, what we're referring to when we're talking about the different pieces of legislation that are currently pending in Congress. And then we're going to get into specifically four of the different pieces of legislation that are pending, mostly at the Senate, but a couple of things are pending at the House as well. We wanted to get into some details about what those different pieces of legislation entail. None of them have been finalized yet. I think that's an important point that we might make a couple of times throughout today's broadcast. But we just want to emphasize that these are all things that are pending, worth exploring for sure as, as advocates and VA law practitioners. We're keeping our eye very carefully on these pending pieces of legislation, but also what the details are with respect to each, kind of what are the pros and cons, what are some things that we see in some pieces of the legislation as opposed to others. We want to keep you all informed as to what is going on in government right now with respect to burn pits, which is a really pressing issue, frankly, nowadays, a very timely one. And I'm sure that we will have rolling updates as we have more information in the future. So we want to start off, like I said, by giving an overview. What are burn pits? What should you know about burn pits if you're not really familiar with this topic or issue? So Christine, could you start us off with some general information for, for what viewers should know? Absolutely. So let's get started with what burn pits are. Uh, military burn pits are large areas of land in which the military and its contractors incinerated all waste that, were, that was generated by military bases. So that included plastics, medical waste, rubber, human waste, pretty much anything um, that was around, they would, um, they would incinerate in these burn pits. Um, U.S. military used burn pits as part of their waste disposal protocol in places such as Iraq and Afghanistan in the post-9-11 era. And although the practice was effective in reducing large quantities of waste, these pits emitted um, plumes of toxic smoke. And so now, as a result, many U.S. military veterans who were exposed to these burn pits have suffered health consequences, from, um, including respiratory ailments and long-term deterioration of lung health. Great. Thank you. And as Christine mentioned, um, these are there, there are so many numerous locations where burn pits were present. And there are many different variations of how big and expansive the burn pits were. But I think something that we have seen in talking with a lot of veterans who have served in the Gulf War and War on Terror era um, is that these were widely used um, and that we know. So any health effects that are associated with exposure to these burn pits, no matter kind of how expansive they might have been in some locations or uh, maybe a little bit smaller in others, it's going to impact a, a pretty big population of veterans, which is why we're keeping our eye on, on the different pieces of legislation that are pending. And with respect to those, there's four major bills pending right now in Congress that we wanted to talk about. Um, I'm not going to get into the really long names. We can kind of take those as we go. I'm going to ask Christine and Nick to help me out with the details of each. But I think what we need to know for now, like I was saying in the beginning, is that there are four uh, bills pending right now. Most are with the Senate. I believe the first one we're going to talk about, though, is pending at the House. And we will be watching these very carefully. I think even this month, there are set to be updates and um, new progress on these bills. So there might be news that we have to cover in the future. I want to start with Nick um, to talk about the first bill that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is pending with the House. So can you go through some of the details with respect to the first one we have on our list? Yep, so that's correct. The first one we're going to talk about is pending with the House of Representatives. Uh, this one is called the Conceding Our Veterans Exposure Now and Necessitating Training Act, or the Covenant Act for short. Uh, and this piece of legislation was introduced by uh, Representative Elaine Loria in March 2021. Um, it's currently pending at the committee level in the House of Representatives, um, and it, it aims to do a number of different things. Uh, first and foremost, it wants to streamline, streamline the VA claims process uh, by creating a list of presumptive conditions. So it removes the nexus requirement for these conditions, and all you would need to show is that you served in particular areas of concern and any of the following list of conditions might be would be considered presumptively service-connected. 
Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list because it's pretty sizable, um, but some of them include uh, asthma um, that was diagnosed after a period of service, uh, cancers of the head and neck, uh, res certain respiratory cancers. Um, it says of any type, but it, you, that remains to be seen. Um, gastrointestinal cancers, reproductive cancers, certain types of lymphoma, brain cancer, COPD, emphysema, pleuritis, pulmonary fibrosis. So lots of respiratory conditions, like Christine mentioned at the top, a lot of these conditions are focused on decreased lung health, um, but many different cancers would be considered presumptively service-connected under the proposed legislation. Um, and then in addition to creating the presumptions themselves, uh, it would open up health care to any veteran sick from burn pit exposure. Um, and like we talked about, it would do away with most of the burden of proof. Uh, veterans would just need to prove that they served in affected areas during covered time periods. Uh, and once that's accomplished, then presumptive service connection should be straightforward from there. Um, in terms of the specific areas covered, uh, it would be any veterans who served after August 1st, 1990 in Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, or the United Arab Emirates. And then it also covers veterans who served after 9-11, after the 9-11 attacks in Afghanistan, Djibouti, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, Uzbekistan, the Philippines, or any country determined to be relevant by VA secretaries. Uh, one thing to note about this bill, um, again, it's, meant, it's one of the most expansive amongst the new bills that they're considering. Um, it is considered to be potentially less costly than some of the other bills, and it covers a fairly wide range of illnesses. But one of the things that sticks out about it is that it doesn't allow for new conditions to be added or covered later. Um, so this is a, of particular concern to us because just like with Vietnam conditions that were eventually attributed to Agent Orange, um, there's going to be new science and new studies that show that certain conditions that maybe weren't initially determined to be related to toxic exposures eventually were determined to be related. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as this legislation makes its way through the House. It's a really good point, Nick, and a good editorialization that I was going to plug um, if you hadn't. But yeah, so the the conditions that Nick listed are obviously um, pretty broad and it's a long list. But as Nick notes, um, the, the list of conditions is a finite one in this piece of legislation. So that is something that's important to note. It's not it's not that conditions couldn't be added in the future by way of different pieces of legislation or other initiatives. It's just that this bill doesn't allow for a lot of room for growth or flexibility with respect to the conditions that are known to be associated to burn pit exposure. And as we know through our practice and talking with others who are in this field, the science about exposure and health related issues is an evolving one. Um, it's really pretty cutting edge. Uh, I wish that weren't the case because burn pits have been an issue now for virtually decades, uh, but it is, it is the case that there is constantly new information coming about um, with, with respect to exposure and the, the health effects. So um, good thing to keep in mind. As Nick mentioned too, this does seem to be a pretty sweeping bill as, composed to, as opposed to some of the others that we'll talk about later. Uh, but I wanna switch gears to Christine to talk about the second bill that I believe this one is pending on the Senate side. So could you give us some background on this second piece of legislation? Yeah, so this bill is the Presumptive Benefits for Warfighters Exposed to Burn Pits and Other Toxins Act of 2021. It is pending in the Senate. Um, it was originally proposed last year uh, and was reintroduced by Senators uh, Kirsten Gillibrand and Marco Rubio. Uh, a version of this bill is also set to be reintroduced um, mid-April by Representatives Raul Ruiz and Brian Fitzpatrick in the House. Um, and so my understanding is it's going to be pretty soon, maybe this week even. Um, the bill aims to remove a VA requirement that veterans prove a link between um, a dozen diseases and exposure to burn pits and other toxins. And instead, veterans would, would only have to submit documentation that they received a campaign medal associated with the global war on terror or the Gulf War um, and that they suf suffer from a qualifying health condition. So this bill, it interestingly, uses the law providing health care to the victims of the 9-11 attacks as a blueprint. And um, that's because, you know, it's due to the similarities of first responders getting sick and dying from inhaling toxic debris. 
Unlike Luria's bill um, that Nick was talking about, this bill does allow for the addition um, uh, for addition of additional health conditions. Um, so as science uh, reveals, you know, more uh, more telling information on diseases that that are related to burn pits, um, those could be added. And so this sort of paves the way for that. So, for example, sinusitis and rhinitis are not included as presumptive conditions in this bill, which is different from Laurie's bill. Um, so it has fewer conditions. But again, um, the fact that you can add conditions, it would be a bonus to, to this bill. And it does have the backing of some key veteran groups. Um, so that's pretty notable about this. And I think one of the things that's different from a separate bill that I'm going to talk about in just a moment is, as you mentioned, Christine, the creation of a presumed link between exposure and uh, the development of a disability later in time. The third bill that we wanted to talk about today was the Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act. This has been introduced to the Senate by two members of the Senate Veterans um, Affairs Committee back in February. This bill would essentially create a recognition and concession of exposure to airborne hazards, toxins, particulate matter, etc. during qualifying periods of service, but it wouldn't automatically grant benefits to any veterans that were deemed exposed in service to any certain conditions. And so I think that makes this, um, this third bill that's in the Senate, the Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act, I think as the title indicates, it's more focused on conceding the in-service exposure element or the in-service exposure piece of a veteran's particular um, disability background if they're filing a claim for disability benefits before the Department of Veterans Affairs, but it doesn't specifically link that exposure to any condition that's developed later in time. So while I think that this bill is a helpful one, and probably would go a long way in helping veterans demonstrate that they were exposed to hazards during their service. It doesn't take the extra step of removing the burden of the veteran to demonstrate that there's a nexus between that exposure and their claimed conditions or any kind of disability that they develop later, which is important for us. Um, we talk all the time about the three elements of service connection and how those are important for veterans that are seeking disability compensation benefits. And the second element of service connection is that something has to have happened in service or something is, uh, there's some event that is tied to the disability that the veteran has. And this would help with that element, but it would not help with assuming that a disability that's developed later is linked to that. I wanna go to you, Nick, for the final of the four pieces of legislation that are pending. Um, if you could talk to us about that. Sure. So the last one we have for you today is the uh, toxic, toxic Exposure in the Military Act, or the TEAM Act. Um, so this was announced by Senator Tom Tillis in April. Um, and the goal of this bill goes a bit beyond what we've talked about up to this point, in that many of the other bills are focused largely on some healthcare aspects, but mostly the veterans benefits aspect. Um, this one's a bit more all encompassing because it would bring together different areas of the VA benefits administration and the healthcare administration um, so that they could eventually create the sorts of presumptive lists that we're talking about with some of the other bills. Um, so with that in mind, uh, it seeks to establish an independent commission to research the health effects of all military toxic exposures. Um, and this research would report its findings to VA and Congress. Um, this would include U.S. bases in addition to any bases located abroad, like the ones that we've discussed up to this point. Um, it would also require VA to enter into an agreement with the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, to conduct scientific studies regarding the association between illnesses and toxic exposure. Um, they entered a, the same sort of contractual agreement with the National Academy of Sciences when they were putting together the IOM reports for Agent Orange, those updates that happened every two years. So this would create a system along those same lines to conduct research and to eventually start adding conditions to a list of presumptive service-connected conditions. Um, and then in addition to those commissions, this would also create a to toxic exposures questionnaire um, that would be administered by all VA primary care physicians during primary care visits um, as a way to determine whether a veteran was exposed to toxins during their service. Uh, 
Um, and then finally, we would also seek to greatly expand training available to BA personnel for toxic exposure related conditions. I think a lot of the elements of the team's bill are represented in other pieces of legislation, ones that we've that we've spoken about today, but even past initiatives, the educational component and the collecting information for healthcare purposes components are really important because as we've mentioned before, the science and the knowledge about health effects is evolving. So it is good to see that some, at least a portion of each of these pieces of legislation for the most part is focused on fostering that additional information and expanding the knowledge base. Um, it will be, of course, the next phase of things to see what VA does with that information. Um, so beyond the bills that we're talking about today and beyond what happens with them, if one makes its way through in the near future, it will then kind of be our responsibility to pivot and see how VA is treating the information that it's gaining and what they're doing to update their regulations in terms of making sure that veterans who do have conceded exposure and have developed um, health effects related to that exposure are getting the, the help and the benefits that they need. So quickly on that point, Christine, could you talk to us a little bit about the impact of this issue? Um, as I said, we don't know which bill is going to make it through or um, whether there will be important amendments that are made later on after these things leave committee stages. But what are we, what are we looking at in terms of the kind of the base of persons that might be affected by this issue? Because it really is a critical one. Yeah, so earlier I said a lot of people were exposed to burn pits. Um, VA estimates it's actually about 3.5 million veterans um, who were exposed to burn pits, um, and that's according to a 2015 report. Um, right now, only about 230,000 of these veterans have registered for VA's burn pit data collection registry. So as we were talking earlier about, well, you know, what the science shows and, and what, um, what it, it reveals is linked or maybe linked to service, Obviously, if VA is only looking at a small number, um, they're only tracking a small number, it's going to be harder to gather and collect that, that data. Um, and so it's, that'll delay some of the um, information on what should get service connected. Um, efforts to provide medical care to military, veteran, vict to military victims of burn pits have long been plagued by delays in Congress and VA. VA maintains that the science is not clear on diseases potentially caused by burn pit exposure, but advocates argue that this is, you know, a way of VA stalling and repeating mistakes, quite frankly, that they made with Vietnam veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange and World War II veterans exposed to radiation. So any of these bills, if passed, would offer much needed relief to veterans suffering the toxic effects of burn pit exposure certainly be better than the status quo where there's inconsistency in who does and doesn't get benefits, um, what conditions do and don't get service connected for compensation purposes. Um, so at a minimum, any of these bills would make it a more standardized um, process, easier to access the benefits um, that would be important for, uh, for these veterans and their family members. I think anyone that's tuned in today that has any experience with the with the VA and with the claims process in particular, which is obviously our primary focus here at CCK, understands that delay is pretty much as integral a component as any um, in the process. It's difficult for sure, but as Christine mentioned, these different pending bills and, and pieces of legislation are a great start. Um, Again, no word on kind of where things are going to go for sure, but that's what our job is, is to keep tracking these things and make sure that we are aware of everything that's going on so that we can bring it back to you all for your awareness. Um, so please stay tuned for any future broadcasts on this subject. I'm sure that we will have more. We should also have more content at our website, cck-law.com, for anyone that's interested in reading a little bit more about this issue and where things stand currently. Um, either way, we hope that this was helpful today. Thank you so much again for tuning in and we hope to see you all next time.